So if it's okay, I'll probably try to start out without the microphone, but if people are having trouble hearing me, then just kind of let me know, and I'll start using the mic. Um, so my name is Brian Kluber. I came up from, or sorry, I came down from, came up from Hadley, Massachusetts, at the Region 5 uh, headquarters there. Fish and Wildlife Service is divided up in the regions, but we're here in the Northeast. I'm really excited to talk to you guys here today. I feel like I've already learned a decent amount from what people have been talking about. And I really value your guys' individual viewpoints on this, and we're really hoping to learn here. So my job here, as I see it, is to tell you guys kind of where we're at, where we're hoping to go, but to also learn from the individual viewpoints and your guys' experience. So we'll go from there. Full disclosure, this presentation is set up, uh, recently was set up, and it's going to be kind of our um, use on a national level, but tailored to certain audiences. So you're probably wondering why we're going to go through so much general information. Oh, okay. I'm usually only holding a microphone when I'm doing karaoke. So I'll try not to, <laughs> try not to go into the 80s. You don't ever do that. So, yeah. But anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into, um, we're going to talk about an introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about the biology of the species. A lot of that stuff is stuff you guys are already going to know, but we kind of got to cover our bases. We're going to talk about the depredation orders that we lost. We're going to talk about the step that we took to try to get some of that management back into place. We're going to talk about where we're at with the free swimming fish and cormorant interaction issue and next steps. And then questions at the end or if you have questions as we go along, that's, that's fine too. So these guys have a pretty big range as I'm sure most of you guys know. They're migratory, but not in a large sense that they're going all the way down to South America, like a lot of our smaller species. The population in Florida is there year-round, but everyone, they, all the other subpopulations, and we pretty much have them identified into four subpopulations as how we manage this species, they tend to migrate, and as I, I believe that they get up here usually around April, late April or early May. Does that sound about right? Probably varies a little bit from year to year. And this is a species that has undergone some range expansions with interactions with humans, and then at other times has undergone range detractions with their interactions with humans, which I hope to be able to demonstrate. But you'll see from some of the specific information, there'll be times when these guys will show up, and then they won't be there. And, you know, wildlife sometimes just does those kinds of things. You can have a map like this, but in 20 years from now, it might be different. One of my first bosses, I told him I saw some, a wildlife given something, it was an ocelot that the book said it wasn't supposed to do, and he told me, the wildlife doesn't read the books. So sometimes they do things that we, that, you know, surprise us. So cormorants went away of most of the migratory bird species that we have in this country in the 1800s. There was basically two things going on, unregulated market hunting, and then for migratory birds, the fashion of those days was actually, for women's hats, was feathers. And I had to look it up, it's actually called millinery is the actual hat trade and, and the art of using fashion for hats. So the combination of these activities going unchecked was basically driving down most of our migratory bird species to really low numbers. I like to use this example just because um, I think a lot of the times you know we think it's a big world out there and maybe we don't have the ability to have an impact on critters. But does anybody know what ha the story of the passenger pigeon by any chance? So the passenger pigeon was by far the most abundant bird species in all of North America. They estimate three to five billion. That's not million, that's billion. The old chronicles say that when they would fly over, they would literally blacken the skies and blacken out the sun. We drove them completely to extinction. The last one died in a zoo in about 1912. So we as humans, as the top predator, have the ability to do those things and the Fish and Wildlife Services has to be accountable for our actions and we're tasked with trying to make sure those mistakes don't happen again. So that's just something I like to talk about is we have the potential to drive these numbers down pretty low and also drive them up pretty high. Just going to talk about cormorants a little bit and something a little more local here. So we had this trend happen late 1800s and 1800s, a lot of these species went down. And then we had the early 1900s, something was passed called the Lacey Act, which helped put some of that unregulated hunting in check. 
There was also just general environmental movements. There was groups like the uh, Orn Ornological Society, sorry, and um, American and Audubon Society, which I'm sure some of you guys know. Some of these groups were created. Some of the first wildlife refuges were created. Basically, a lot of these bird populations started increasing and they started rebounding. And that was just, cormorants started showing up in the places where they, they potentially may have been previously or it was part of a range expansion. We only have the data that's available to us, as you can see here, in Lake Champlain in 1981. Those are the first documented ones used in that area. I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting my hand on a Bible saying that's the first time a cormorant ever used this area, but it's also a possibility. If we don't have the data, we just don't know. As you can see, first documented observations in the Lake, Great Lakes population in 1913 to 20. There, the conflict started. When you're going to have more species that are in competition for a resource with us, and as those numbers go up, the conflicts usually go up too. And that's just kind of the way the cookie usually crumbles. We also had something happen then in the 40s and 50s. We were controlling cormorants at that point, and we were allowing for management. But then all across the country, we were seeing rapid declines again in a lot of our migratory bird populations. Even our national bird, the bald eagle, was down to about 30 birds in the state of New York. So almost driven to extinction. What was going on was a, a chemical called DDT and a couple other things. DDT is a really, really effective insecticide, and it's still used in some third world countries. It's great for controlling things like malaria outbreaks because it gets rid of the mosquitoes. The problem is, is that birds end up ingesting that stuff either directly or secondarily. An eagle might be eating, might be eating a pigeon that consumed um, something. Basically what happens is the birds are still able to lay their eggs, but it thins the egg membrane and shell so much that you virtually have 100% nest failure. So that's what was going on and that's what was driving all these down. And we figured it out, luckily, what was causing that. DDT was banned in this country for the most part, except for extreme circumstances. In the 1970s, you also had the double-crested cormorant family added to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act list, which is what I'm going to talk about in a little bit. You're going to see DCCO a lot in this presentation. We, there's seven species of cormorants, so we try to like save verbiage, and so we use that code. But if I say cormorants or DCCO or double-crested, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about... The, the, the critter you guys are having issues with up here. So why are migratory birds protected? Well, we the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was signed in 1918 by Woodrow Wilson. It was between Canada and the United States. Great Britain signed on behalf of Canada. And basically, it prohibits the taking of migratory birds. Take defined as pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect. It's also important, though, that this is with purposeful take only. If you are engaged in an otherwise lawful activity, <coughs> such as cutting down a tree that you're permitted to do, and there happen to be migratory birds in that tree, that doesn't apply, MBTA doesn't apply there. If your intention is to cut down that tree to kill those birds, MBTA would apply. It's an important distinction, and it's a distinction that actually came about fairly recently. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act so is still around over 100 years. Uh, Japan, Russia, and Mexico also signed on to that treaty over the years. Originally, it was just us and Canada. So here's our, here's our guy in question, right? Here's the double-crested cormorants. This is some numbers from the Great Lakes colonies. So they had a pretty good nest abundance. We're basically saying that nest abundance, we think that's very reflective of how the overall population is doing. It's very expensive, and it's very difficult to go out there and count all these individuals. So a lot of the times we have to use things like nest counts to be our surrogate of abundance, if you will. So we see this incline. We're talking about the 1975s. That's kind of the end of that DDT area, era. Sorry, There were some other things going on, such as the Clean Water Act, that might have improved habitat, state conservation, things of those nature. But as you can see... That's a pretty steady and large population growth rate. That's what we would call exponential growth rate, basically. Just focus on the middle line. The dotted lines are just signifying uncertainty in these numbers. And then we had management actions that started taking place in the late 90s, which I'm going to talk about. But we showed that those management actions were having an effect. They were driving down the populations, and that was our goal. And so we, we were basically 
meeting our management objectives by lowering that number. This is the data that's a little bit closer to home. This was brought. This was uh, given to me by the, the, the more local biologists just here within the last 48 hours. So really appreciate it. But as you can see, also numbers were increasing throughout much of the 20th century for cormorants on um, Young Island and Four Brothers Island. We instigated or instilled these management practices, and the numbers were lowering. And I'm I'm assuming that that was you guys were seeing less cormorants on the landscape, and you know potentially you guys were having less management concerns with that species. And this was going on for years. So we talk about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and we say take is, off, is, off, is, you know, is prohibited, take is not allowed. But there's levers that we can pull to allow take for management purposes. These are the four basically levers that we can pull to do that. We have depredation permits. That's very site specific and species specific. So on any given day, I'll get a permit application that comes across my desk to collect perhaps 50 Canada geese at a specific golf course. And then they're, after the review and approval, they are given a permit to remove those Canada geese from their site. So it's very site specific and the numbers are pointed out. We also have these three things <coughs> called orders. So these are at a larger scale. You don't basically have to have a permit in hand to control migratory birds using these types. We're going to focus on the depredation orders because that's what was being man used as a management tool for double-crested cormorants, but there are these other ones as well. There's a control order and conservation order. The best example for a control order is Canada goose. We've, we've established that we believe Canada geese are overpopulated nationally, and we have programs in place to try to reduce those, and that is a control order. So we have these levers we can pull, but these are all f federal actions and federal undertakings. And since the early 1970s, every federal action, whether it be from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, I don't think there's any agencies that have full exemption of this except for maybe something like Secret Service. Any environmental, any action that we take, we have to fully weigh that potential impact of that action on the human environment. Basically what the human environment means is everything that's out there. It's the bugs, it's the bunnies, it's the people, it's the roads, it's the rivers. We're supposed to do a full assessment of that action and how it can potentially have an effect on all of those factors. And that's law. It's the National Environmental Policy Act. And, and we have to abide by it or we risk uh, basically those actions being invalidated. So in 1998, we instilled one of those depredation orders that I was talking about. This one was specifically for aquaculture, so we're not going to spend a lot of bit of time on this one because this is mostly done in the southeast. The cormorants have done very well in these areas with these catfish farms and other types of farms. It, range contraction has been shown that they probably w weren't occurring in very high numbers before the aquaculture facility there. And so it was recognized that there was a need to control these guys, and so we installed this control order. So it applied to commercial freshwater aquaculture in 13 states. But none of them got really close up here. <clears throat> this is just the numbers showing, you know, we allow that lever to be pulled and that there was a decent amount of take associated with that. So on the left, you're looking at the annual take under this depredation order. So if we scrunched all those numbers together, you'd probably be talking about about 15,000 birds per year or so if we're taking under this particular lever. Over on the right, it's the averages. As you can see, some states definitely took more cormorants than others. Um, some states may have not been fully reporting. We, we, we're not quite sure about that, but we feel like we have a pretty good handle on what was going on with the take that was associated with this order. So we have the one order, and so now we have a second one, and this is the one that you guys have been most affected by, certainly. The Public Resources Depredation Order. So the purpose of this was to reduce the occurrence of adverse impacts on public resources, including fish, by these cormorants. So it was implemented in 2003, but basically it had to be reassessed every five years. Uh, it's it's kind of called a, a sundown clause, if you will. You basically have five years to utilize that order. You basically have to revalidate it and redo your environmental review, or you can no longer use that order. 
And those aren't rules that the Fish and Wildlife Service comes up with. So we extended it in 2009 and in 2014. And it applied to 24 states, so it was a pretty good portion of the country could utilize this tool to control cormorants. Again, just numbers showing the amount of take that was associated with this, but, but pretty high. If you look in 2014, 2015, upwards of uh, over 30,000 birds. So this is just to show that people were utilizing the orders, the agencies were utilizing the orders, and and it was having an effect by driving down the numbers, you would assume, by the take. So we also had the depredation permits going on this whole time. This is more in my wheelhouse at the regional level. I'm an administrator of these permits here in the northeastern region. So these were off, still allowing for health and human safety. Um, we allow former on take at airports, of course. Human health and safety is extremely important to us. Uh, a depredation permit, it lasts for a year. It's intended to be semi-short-term, but we have many that are renewed every year. You have to employ lethal and non-lethal methods, and we work very closely with USDA Wildlife Services. They're basically our partner with this. They are, the application has to come with a, basically a seal of approval from Wildlife Services, and they recommend the number that the individual can take. So we had three different levers that we could pull. This is the take that, that was going on with just those permit types. So a little bit more closer to home here. You can see here in Vermont, the third one on to the right. Numbers were pretty low, but this is, remember, this is just adult take, and this is just from those permits. So some entities were still choosing to pull the lever using the permits, even though that those orders were in place, and some of this would be things like airports where those orders weren't applicable to. This is bringing in a little bit, uh, getting at the numbers here locally, the Lake Champlain numbers a little more importantly. This isn't just Lake Champlain, but this is New York and Vermont. As you can see, this is the total amount that was taken using this tool, all the tools combined. And you can see in New York, we were over 50,000 birds from 2004 to 2016. Nests were lower here in Vermont, and the overall numbers were lower. But New York's a bigger state. Uh, to me, those numbers kind of pass the eyeballs test. Every permit that we have, people will report the take to us, and we just put it into a big database and so we can keep track of all the take. So this is kind of where the rubber hits the road, right? So what happened? That everything was, we, were, we had these management tools in place, and people were utilizing them. So there was a federal judge that, that made a ruling. Uh, the suit was brought by public employees for environmental responsibility. One of the highlights in this complaint was, was basically the people, put values, people put different values on wildlife species. There was concerns that we were driving down the cormorant numbers so much that we were potentially taking away the values of other American citizens for this particular species. There was other things that the judge pointed out as well. These are, the 2014 EA failed to address these things according to this judge. Basically, what it boils down to is the judge's opinion was that we didn't take a good enough, hard enough environmental look at when we approved and did our environmental review for these orders. This is uh, publicly available as well. If anyone's interested, I can, I can send you this. It's in legal speak, so it's a little difficult to read, but I'm happy to send it. Alternatives. Part of that NEPA process is that you have to come up with at least two alternatives uh, for more than that, usually if it's an in environmental impact statement, which is kind of like the highest level of environmental review. But the judge, he, he determined that we did not look at enough of potential alternatives to help meet the need for this <coughs> issue with double-crested cormorants and management for these, other, these resource types and these management concerns. So this is some of the actual language found to be arbitrary and capricious. Again, like I said, legal speak. But basically what it boiled down to is when a judge makes a ruling like this, regardless if the agency disagrees with that decision, the standard fare is for those orders to be vacated. They're basically removed from the Code of Federal Regulations, and I as a Fish and Wildlife employee no longer have them as a tool at my disposal. That's what happens. Well, anything else we can take from this? So you got to remember, what we still had, though, we had the orders pulled away from us, but we still had the depredation permits as a potential tool in our tool shed that we could manage double-crested cormorants for. 
<coughs> However, we had some concerns and some reservations about simply allowing depredation permits to be used for all these previous resource needs and all these different types, such as for free swimming fish, because basically the same inadequacies that the judge pointed out were out there, and people knew about them. So we decided that we needed to do a new environmental review to basically justify our use of depredation permits to control double-crested cormorants. So we wrote a new EA, that's an I'm sorry, environmental assessment. You have different layers of documentation for NEPA. EIS is usually the most complex and takes the most amount of time. EA is in the middle, and then there's something called environmental action statement and categorical exclusions down in the lowest. So this was middle ground that we decided to write and prepare a document to look at issuing permits for double-crested cormorants. And sorry, it's kind of hard to see, but basically, because the depredation orders really didn't apply to the Pacific side of the country, we didn't write the EA to involve that part of the country. So we tried to address four different levels of scope in the EA. We did human health and safety, aquaculture, T&E species, and property damage. We picked those four types in the EA because we felt like we could clearly establish the need, we felt like the data was there to support those claims, and we figured with these four types we wouldn't have to potentially write an EIS. When you have to go to an EIS level, if there is any potential unknown environmental consequences of your action or any negative. As soon as you make that determination, an EA is irrelevant and it gets bumped up into an EIS and you basically start the process over. The decision was made and it was certainly a difficult one and it was made uh, by, by a lot of individuals and, and a lot of thinking is that at the time when we were writing this EA, we could not include free swimming fish because the need was not clearly established and we could not check all those boxes in order to be able to get this EA pushed through to be able to allow for management for these different types of conflict. We'll talk about that more. So we've decided in the EA to basically manage the cormorants and talk about them in terms of different populations. And one of the things that you also need to do in NEPA is use the best available science at your disposal to make your determination. But that doesn't mean you need to go out and do a new study for every single thing out there and every stone that hasn't been unturned, but it means you have to use the best available science and the best available data. And if it's really lacking, then your, your EA might be in trouble. And you might have to go out and do some of those studies. So we crunched the numbers and we came up with population estimates for double-crested cormorants. I'm only going to focus on the upper left-hand side because this is what you guys would be interested in. But we estimated at the time of the EA, and this was signed in December of 2017. So even though this says 2017, it really came at the 11th hour of 2017. So this is all pretty recent stuff. But we believe there's between 252 and 268,000 double-crested cormorants that are utilizing the Atlantic Flyway and are basically that Atlantic Flyway population. All these dots, which I'm sure is really messy to look at, this is trying to show that we put a bunch of, uh, well we didn't, there was a study by universities that put a bunch of GPS transmitters on cormorants and it showed that they kind of adhere to these flyway populations, which basically means if you're born on the Atlantic coast and you're a cormorant, you're probably going to stay there. Same with the Great Lakes, same with the Pacific. There was a couple that did weird things, but for the most part, this study showed that managing at the, f at the flyway population scale, we have justification to do that, using the best available science. But you can also look at the totals. So we, we believe that there's between 730,000 and 752 cormorants. So that's a pretty decent population, I would argue. So we, know how, we think we know how many cormorants we are that are out there. What, well, now what we needed to do is use the science to determine how many we think that we can allow to be killed and still allow that population not to be driven to extinction or to a non-sustainable level. Because one of the primary missions of the Migratory Birds Division is that we need to manage at sustainable levels. That doesn't mean we want every population of migratory birds to be as high as it can be. And that's not what we do under normal circumstances because we have those levers that we can pull. So basically we, we went out there and we collected all the best information that we can and we came up with some numbers that say, if we can take these many cormorants on a yearly basis 
and still have our bases covered and help meet the conflict, but then also help sustain that population. So that's the biological. An environmental assessment has to have alternatives. It has to have action, it has to have alternative actions that can meet your need, or basically you're not doing NEPA. So we have our biological number, but then we also had our number that was based on all of the historical take from all of the depredation, the depredation orders and the permits. So we had two alternatives to choose from is the way we devised the CA. We can take the maximum number of birds using the population model or we can take a lesser number based on the previous need. And we basically decided to take that lower level. That was what was considered our preferred alternative. So that means we're allowing less take now than we potentially biologically could. The silver lining on that, if you will, and it specifically states this in the EA, that we can review this information and now we have additional take that is basically available that we can potentially use for other conflicts, such as free swimming fish or runs. So we have those numbers basically, hopefully to be able to use in the future. The number that I have to look at every time I get a cormorant depredation permit across my desk is this 11,634, and then even closer, because not all the Atlantic flyways here in the Northeast, although most of it is in our region, is this 10,170. That's how many birds that I can allow to be cormorants that I can be allowed to be killed per year. If I go over that, I'm, I'm going to be getting some phone calls from people a lot higher up the food chain than I. That's basically the number that we here in Region 5 have to deal with, 10,170. But it could go up because the biological model says we could take more birds than that and still sustain cormorant populations. That's annually. Yes, annually. Yeah. Apologize if I didn't state okay. that. So now we're getting into you know what you guys are obviously most passionate about, and rightfully so, is this cormorant fish interactions, and we're terming free swimming fish interactions, right? Because we we're allowing take at aquacultures; those are fish. But it basically, the decision was made: free swimming versus aquaculture and hatcheries. If there's if there's trout and there's salmon. They're actually in a concrete hatchery. We would consider that to be in that aquaculture category, and we would currently be allowing permits for that take if cormorants are going in there. And this is where we're at, basically. We know there's there's been good work that's been done here locally in the Champlain, and there's been a lot of good work that's been done on the Great Lakes. The issue with fish, bird. Uh, uh, fish and fish eating bird studies, just like any wildlife study, is that they're usually done at very small scales because they're very expensive to do. Um, it's amazing how much, a, you wouldn't think wildlife studies can, but you go out there and you throw collars on critters and some other stuff and before you know it, you're, you're in the six figures. It's, 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 it's um, you know, everything costs money. So, the problem with local studies is that they can show really good information. Um, a potential pitfall of them is because something is going on at this scale doesn't mean it's going on at a larger scale. And if we potentially extrapolate too far and just utilize a few small studies, we potentially run uh, open ourselves up to future risk uh, such as things as lawsuits. So we're trying to be very careful and methodical, which we know unfortunately has consequences, as we compile all this information that the states have and these other resources and entities so we can look at this information regarding cormorants and free swimming fish and see what the data is telling us out there and see if there's knowledge gaps. But basically what it boils down to is, is down here in red. We've determined that we need to collect, review, synthesize, and we need to get at what is going on with cormorants and the free swimming fish. Not only at Lake Champlain, but the other areas where they're being impacted. Great Lakes, for example. So, this thing makes my head spin every time I look at it, and I didn't create this. This was created by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and this is how they look at factors that influence yellow perch populations in their system. So we have a lot of things that are potentially going on in the basically take-home messages, and, and you guys are well aware of this, fisheries are complicated, and fish-eating birds is down there on the lower rung right here. So that would include cormorants. So this graph is, oh, sorry about that. 
lucky. So what this graph is basically saying is that fish-eating birds, in this case cormorants, are, are one potential factor that can be influencing these populations, and this term yellow perch, but I would argue that you could probably use a similar schematic for others. And I don't even know what some of this stuff means on this graph, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. What I do think about it when I look at this graph is, and how we're moving forward is, I think of some of these boxes as being stones that we basically have to turn over. So we're in the process right now of trying to turn over as many stones as we can so we can come forward and present management possibilities and options. So, conflicts with birds and humans are not going away. If anything, they might be becoming more pervasive, and they will be in the future. We've developed as an agency, this, this is basically a diagram showing how we're trying to move forward with species conflicts. So this is what's called a species conflict framework. And this is what we're doing to try to move forward. We've pretty much used this model um, so far with black vultures. But this will be kind of our first full goal of using this framework. It's an adaptive management approach, which I'm sure all of you know. Basically, we have to collect our information. We have to determine our options. We have to do that environmental review. If we don't do the NEPO, we run the risk of you know, putting forth a lot of work and having it taken away from us, as we did with the depredation orders. And then we're going to see how it works. And then we're not going to set anything in stone. We're going to reevaluate as we go. Now. We got one box checked so far. I'm going to be honest with you. We know that this is a conflict. We recognize it's a conflict. That's why we had tools in place for quite some time to help deal with this conflict. So right now we're at the state agency engagement stage. We're using the flyway model. The flyway is how we set. The flyway model is collaboration and cooperation with the states and the federal agencies. It's what we use to set all of our duck and goose seasons. So the federal, the federal agency will make recommendations and the state agency will provide input, and they may modify those. For example, I was on a sea duck hunt three weeks ago in Cape Cod. I could take less eiders there than I could in Maine because the state of Massachusetts was more worried about their eider population, and they didn't want me taking those extra birds. So that's the way the flyway system works in kind of a, in a very cursory way. So the rest of this is, is to be determined. This is where we're at, and this is where we're trying to move forward, and we're, we're trying to move forward as fast as we can. The, the EA was basically signed in December of 2017, so just a couple months ago. We're, right now, we are hiring, we're looking to get a facilitator, or we are getting a facilitator that's going to help manage these meetings, and we're going to be doing this at the flyway level, where each state agency will be at the table with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and we're going to try to come up with some solid options to move forward. So this is kind of just reiterating what I said, and this slide is way too busy with, with information. But I, I, highly, I highly advise you guys, and I highly recommend that as, you, as your concerns, as you have concerns, and if you, if you have information, contact your state agencies and also reach out to us. We want your concerns and your viewpoints to be a part of this process, and we're going to do our darndest to make sure that they are. Um, it just takes some time, I'm not going to lie, but we're working on it. I didn't include the names of the flyway representatives from New York and Vermont because we did this kind of, um, this, this presentation got done just a few days ago and I wanted to have their permission, but, but they're out there and, and we can get you this information and, and my contact will be here. These were put in at very much the 11th hour at the request of my bosses. This is just to show you guys how the flyway system works and how we're going to be moving forward. So basically, we're going to have meetings here on the right side of the country where all these different states are going to have seats at the table and we're going to try to come up with some viable solutions. Again, I think that I've probably talked enough. This is just showing you guys more of how the flyway system works. We're excited about this because the flyway system has been around since the 1950s, so we're not reinventing the wheel. We're going to use a process that's been tested and tried and true to help get this cormorant free swimming fish issue addressed. And yeah, we're going to go and move on to those. So yeah, that's where we're at, and uh, we're hoping that we can move forward on things. And uh, I know that everything I've said today probably doesn't satisfy you guys completely, and I understand, but we're trying to move forward, and we're, we're hoping to be able to allow as many management vehicles as we can. So, yeah. Do you see that you have adequate funding to do your work? And is that in danger? We're very grateful for the resources that we have. The, the president's, the new budget that just came out actually had a, 
a slight increase for migratory birds, which has been uh, the, that's been the exception to the rule over the last years. I believe Fish and Wildlife Service has been seen a, a it, levels have been s the same or slightly decreasing over the last ten years. The problem with federal agencies is when you have um, when you have this, you have um, things like inflation and every people's wages are supposed to go up. If your employees do a good job, you're supposed to treat them well. When you have budgets that go like this, in, in essence, they're, they're kind of going down like this. So I would say that um, we're happy with the resources that we have. Um, we've got some, some tools at our disposal, but more resources are always nice, but, but we're grateful for what we have. Um, yes? We, we all want to shoot these things while we're fishing. Yeah, so I you understand. tried that, right? How did that go? <laughs> You have tried that, right? Well, so I, um, so this comes down to um, this, this, the, you know, well, actually, in a way, yes. So what happened in South Carolina and in Texas under that aquaculture depredation order, uh, basically the state agencies uh, deputized citizens to be allowed to, to, to be able to shoot cormorants without a permit, without anything. The numbers were very high, and that became known that, that those things were going on, and you can potentially conclude that, that those type of actions may have something to do with that lawsuit coming to bear. And that lawsuit came to bear, and we lost our tools. So I would not advise people to, 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 to shoot them. I, the, it is potential, but when we go through this flyaway process, you know, I don't think that anything has been left off the table so far of how we're going to use the vehicle for management. If we're only going to allow certain entities to take, if we're going to allow individuals, I, it's, we're, we're just way too early on to know that. But but I'd say that nothing is completely off the table at this point. Is that I don't know if I, I don't did I answer your question or no? So you tried it and somebody got sued. Yes, got, we got, got sued. Who did? We did the Fish and oh, Wildlife Service. Because you let us. Yeah. Yes. And you're probably never going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, those, so we lost those, we lost those two specific orders, but those, those that, that mechanism is still in place. So there, the control order and the depredation orders, those are still there. I've got a big fat book over there that's the Code of Federal Regulations for Wildlife, and, and there's other ones in there. It's like the, there's a depredation order right now that's still in place for, for crows, grackles, and blackbirds. So the, those tools, I believe, if we, do our, if we do our due diligence and we do a good job, I believe that we are going to hopefully have those tools to use again. It just takes a while to check all the boxes and to make sure that, A, the need is there, the science is there, and that we have all the review in place so we don't potentially lose our tools again. Do you believe that would be a good idea? I believe that wildlife management is a very difficult thing. We have a lot of people that have different values on wildlife. There are individuals in this room that I'm sure want every cormorant out there to be gone from the world, and there are other people that are probably in Burlington that want every cormorant to be here and probably double the population. So it's a very difficult thing. I believe that when we have conflicts, we need to come up with solutions to help individuals like yourselves. Um, to be able to have make a li to, to have a livelihood and to be able to live your lives with wildlife. So I'm a fan of all those tools. I'm a fan of being able to pull those levers. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I will say it does bother me that you don't have funding enough to do some of these research, like take some of these cormorants and see what they're eating at certain times of the year to get a study. And uh, that would be nice if you had the money. The other thing when we're talking about hunting. Cormorants, so to speak, uh, and I'm sure you thought about it. If you run it like you do duck seasons or anything else, people have to pay. So one, you're getting rid of something you want, mm -hmm. and other, you're getting money in return to fund. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Other things, mm -hmm. you know, like let's say, okay, we get rid of half the cormorants to whatever we can, and we make a few hundred thousand, a million dollars. And you put it towards these wildlife services where the people who don't want them to go. Yeah. You kind of get it to the middle like you do with yeah. the game hunting. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I think we're, that, yeah. we're make, actually paying <coughs> to make more wildlife areas yeah. for other things. It makes other people feel good that you're not just out there absolutely. killing something to get rid of it. Yeah, and, and like I said, our migratory bird division, our, our, our goal is not to have every population of migratory bird to be at, at their peak. It's yeah. all about sustainable. And, you know, and, and sometimes that, that halfway mark is the best. That's yeah, when the population is going. 
you know, you're going to be slow because you have to. There's a lot of channels, there's a lot of other stuff. But again, the population we can see is, is going way faster than it is the other way. Yeah, that's... We're, that's you know, we don't have to go out on the flyway. We can just be sitting here on the lake. Yep. Just five years ago, you said, oh my God, look at that, there's 30 of them. Now you go out and there's 3,000 of them yep. flying over you. In yeah, big, huge blocks. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a concern, and, and we showed, and we showed right that the we showed that that it was a very effective management tool to, that we brought to bear, and so it's it, it's logical that if you take that away, you're going to have population increase. So what we need to do at this stage is we need to make sure that that data is being incorporated into this new decision and this new review. And that's one of the things we'll make sure we do is that every piece of information that is out there about the current population, we'll make sure that that's included. The states do a great job, New York and Vermont, they, they do a great job and we are very, we, we rely heavily on the expertise and the tools that the states bring to bear. And that's why I'm excited about using the flyway structure for this. I think it's a great model of how the states and the feds work together, so, yes. What's the, uh, Natural limitations on uh, corporate populations. Is it is it uh, breeding habitat or is it uh, available forage? With these guys, I would say that um, there's a big debate, you know, overall in general about top down versus bottom up population control and regulation from everything to wolves to guppies. I would say with these guys, once they reach the, uh, especially once they reach the adult status, other than humans, I don't think they have too many predators. So I think with these guys, they're probably more, in the absence of heavy predation, I would say that their population is more controlled by bottom factors than top. But usually it's a mixed bag. That's the tough thing, right? What do you consider a bottom factor? Oh, the food source. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's been going on for 30 years. You'll get, you, you still get biologists in a room and they argue about um, what's controlling a population. And usually, it's like almost anything, it's, it's usually a bit, a bit of both. So it's not... You know, the availability of an island to build their nests or nest, like Yeah, that. habitat and nesting shrub street could, I think certainly plays a factor as well, you're right. I mean, the, the habitat is important. If they don't have anywhere to nest, there could be all the fish in the world, you're right, but it's not going to matter. So you're right, the nesting habitat is, a, is an extremely important thing. And we know that these guys can go into an area and we, and we know there can be degradation of those sites. And you guys are more familiar with that than me. And, um, and that's one of the tools that we're allowing currently because because the free-swimming fish issue we feel is so complex, we just felt like we, we had to take it at its own separate entity, basically. Yes? Do you, do you have an idea of what the natural lifespan is left alone? Yeah, the, that information is definitely out there, and I, and, I, and I read some of that a couple weeks ago. But, but these guys are on a longer-lived bird. I believe these guys can, can be upwards of 15 years old. Um, I, I, have to, I have to take a look at that. But, um, so yeah, once they reach that adult reproductive age, they can they can be pumping out chicks for quite some time. Um, so if, if, free, oh, okay. if, if free swimming fish are, are really on the table, um, how about the loss of our native species that have been pretty much decimated by the overabundance of cormorants? Mm. I mean, you know. Four brothers, and uh, used to be a bird sanctuary, and now there's no birds left on the sanctuary mm -hmm. except for cormorants and gulls. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's not just you know the the effects of free swimming fish, but I mean they're having major effects on our native bird populations. Yeah. So I've actually got a, a permit application uh, on my desk when I get back. That that's a that's an application to allow for for protection of some of those avian species. And so we are allowing for that. We have that priority scheme. So I basically have those that number that I have to stay under, or I'm in, in deep doo doo. Um, that's human health and safety and private property, and the T and E is the, is the third species. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to give out the the authorization that we want for that, and then. So, so yeah, we are allowing for that currently. The issue also, though, where it becomes more complicated, right, is because what if we have some fish species that are threatened and endangered? That's why we got to get. That's why we got to get our our boots moving, and we got to get this problem solved because the fishery is complex. It's not just for the popular sports fish. You could also have potential impacts on these less abundant fish species. So yeah, I agree. We need to do work on that. So some of the 
some of the islands and places where uh, it's personally owned, not state or federal, do they ask for the permit from you? Like if I owned an island and it was covered with cormorants, would I submit a permit to your department? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. You can so. submit that. You can submit that. Uh, you can submit that, and you work with Wildlife Services. You provide your justification, and with cormorants, we are. We are taking a pretty hard look at those applications. We want to see the justification. We want to see the pictures of the trees mm -hmm. and the areas destroyed, you know, because we know that there's people out there watching. You know, we there was a big lawsuit, so that is absolutely a possibility. And I and I we do have permits out there right now that are authorizing that very thing. Yes. A couple questions. So the Atlantic Flyway is a potential. If I understood your data, quarter of a million cormorants coming on Lake Champlain, right? I don't. I, I wouldn't say that that is that is the population estimate for the the entire flyway. So I wouldn't say they're all those all those birds would okay. be coming here. Wanted, but. Uh, the program, one of the programs that I know about, is the spraying of the oils to prevent the the eggs from hatching. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? And also, what about the, uh, the the total numbers of cormorants? Even with even if the egg uh, prevention uh, program had worked you're still going to not cut down on the total numbers of cormorants returning every year. Yeah, exactly. So, there, yeah, there, there's definitely been different things that have been tried with cormorant management. One of the earlier things that was being done was just going out and, and destroying the nests. Basically, just, you know, however you seem fit, if you're going to, you know, if you're just going to step on them and then dispose of them, there was a lot of that done. But, yeah, so that's not a good tool, right? Because these guys can go out there and provide their resources and they can just put down another nest. So that's why we started doing the egg addling and the oiling. So you're basically tricking the birds. They still think that they're taking care of a a, a, ha a nest that's going to hatch, but it's not. That's why that's why that's a good tool because we're basically tricking the cormorants. But I agree that is helping with reproduction, but that's not going to drive down population levels quickly. And so yeah, uh, bringing lots of tools to bear and, and adult take. If you really want to bring down a population, it should be a combination of addressing reproduction and then also adult take. So does that, the oil, does that fall into the depri deprivation category that you're talking about? It does, it does. So the way the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is, is written is that an, an egg and a feather even has the same protection as a, a live bird. That's, that's how it was done. But you can get a depredation permit that allows for killing of birds and also nest destruction. You can get that all under a depredation permit. You just currently can't get it for free swimming fish until we can address the issue better. Yes? I have a couple of questions. First, um, do you know, I saw that New York had about 7,000 permits uh, issued to former in Vermont, had 2,000. But as you know, Champlain is uh, shared by New York and Vermont. Do you know how many permits from New York are going to Champlain? Um, I don't have those. In, I don't have those numbers, unfortunately, offhand. But if you want to take down my email address and you want to send me that question, I, I can go into the database and see if I can ferret out that information. I'm sorry, I don't have that. And second, uh, are there any bureaucratic avenues that states can pursue to manage cormorants similar to other waterfowl species that are governed by the federal uh, government, so that we can? One, get revenue coming into the states and tags and licenses, and two, better manage the number of cormorants that are be being taken per hunter so we can um, not have these big spikes um, from these deputized folks that are um, yeah. just shooting. I, I, I think that, yeah, so in, in as far as currently, what can, this, can the states do? The best thing is that the, the, the best thing that a state can do is to, they're going to get the invitation to participate in those, in those meetings with us. And we're gonna bring all. We're gonna put all the possibilities out on the table, and we're gonna see what can and can't be done. To be honest, I'm a little naive on how it works of just allowing a species that hasn't been traditionally hunted to be allowed. I don't know the full process that goes into creating that regulation. Um, I think it would take a new regulation. One of the, the the current environment that we live in, for every regulation that we create, we're supposed to remove two. Adding re new regulations to the Code of, Fed re re Code of Federal Regulations right now is extremely difficult. So if a lot of that will depend on how the regulations have to be adjusted or if they create new. So the other question is, if you guys know about the wanton waste law, right? So 
if we do allow hunting of cormorants, you potentially have to eat them, and I'm not sure if anyone here, myself included, <laughs> would do that. But, but yeah, I, I'm not saying it's. A, I just don't have the expertise on the hunting side of things. Unfortunately, I, I don't get to work in that wheelhouse much. But I'll I'll find that information out. Coyotes. <laughs> all right, you guys, all set. Thank you. Thank you, man. Well, I know I, I know this is a tough issue, and I, I thank you guys all for listening to me and, and my rambling. And um, and yeah, we'll we'll hopefully get somewhere. Uh, sooner than later. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. We're going to take a break so everybody can get up, stretch your legs, go pee, do whatever you got to do, and then we're going to come back and listen to Brad, and then we're going to have the raffle.